Hi, book club members. I'm Jen. And I'm Carrie. And this is Warhammer 40k Book Club, where we read from a crag. This is episode number 67, and our book is Steel Tread by Andy Clark. It is the story of a brand new commander of a Lehman Rust tank on the war-torn world. It was exciting. We posted several questions on our website, wh40kbookclub.com, and we encourage participation in our conversations via Twitter, YouTube, our site, or Encrypted Box channel. Spoiler alert, if you haven't yet read the book, go to the site, check out the book and the questions, and then come back here as we'll be discussing this from start to finish in great detail. Also, for people who listen to this podcast on a regular basis and know that I talk a lot with my hands, we're doing bathroom renovations. It's like glaring injury on my hand. Anyways, (laughs) it's been a fun week. As always, Carrie, did you like the book? I did like it. I really liked this book. It was kind of a welcome change of pace to get like a a very straightforward just a day in the life of story Mm -hmm. no great mystery or overarching lore changes there's no calls to reboot after this uh bob's voicemail isn't getting overflowed no i mean you could call him but he'd be like and (laughs) <laughs> and it's day ending. Why? And uh, why is your planet so special? Is there a manufacturer we need to care about? No? All right. <laughs> kind of fish. I well, don't know. I mean, you know, just for him to get involved. Is there a titan there? So I'm now getting, yeah, I feel. As I'm getting yeah. to the plot of Space Marine. Yeah, I feel as though if they were to call Bob, it would be a lot of them going, hello? 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 They would they would have gotten hung up on very quickly. Well, they wouldn't have called him anyway because they don't believe that the uh, Adeptus Astartes exist, most of them. So, okay, so jumping into what parts stood out, I think, and I know I've said this before, but I forget that because we read so many Space Marine books, I forget that the average guardsman, uh, first off, their life expectancy is 15 hours. Second off, that they'll go their whole lives without ever seeing a space marine. Lots of statues of them, sure, but the concept of an actual, like, the actual being is just, no, it's, that's just legends. That's just, like, the equivalent of us talking about, like, dragons and stuff. Pretty much, yeah. Which I think, and we'll talk about this a little bit later, but I think that was one of my favorite scenes was when she finally sees the traitor marines and she's just like they don't they don't make sense like they're out of proportion and they're weird and well like i mean the heretic of course is because they're gonna be all mutated and stuff the noise marines but i feel felt like it was kind of just in general she's like they're too big to be people yes darling (laughs) that's kind of um but one of the parts that stood out to me early that i wanted to call out was of course the tech marine I liked when somebody sassed the tech marine and they were like, if you wish to continue this to make yourself feel better, you go ahead and do that. But I don't care. And walks off. It was like the sassiest insult delivered from a, a de- from a, a mechanicus guy. No, I, mean, I didn't care. <laughs> it's just like, ah, eh, mechanicus being mechanicus. We're mechanicus better than you. Mechanicus. We're better than you in every way. We have no really talk to you when it's absolutely necessary. Whatever. That's why it, right. did, it did crack me up near the end when Etzul saw him. And she was just like, she was revolted by him because he doesn't look human. And especially after everything that they've seen with the mm-hmm. heretic knight. Like, I'm like, yes, dear. They are creepy. Yeah. Well, and I liked, I had to figure out because I wrote it down on the page on here. Uh, on page 204, one of my favorite scenes in this book is uh, when Vero tries his old wife's tale cure and he, have you tried turning it off and turning it back on again? I loved that that was like the old folk cure, right? Which would be like, I don't know, the equivalent of getting a cut and rubbing dirt on it. (laughs) That like he's doing this thing with all this blood and saying these prayers and I'm like, you just, turned it off and turned it back on which to be fair was effective yeah maybe the maybe it needed blood 
It's done with the sweat and tears. It needed some blood. <laughs> that could be. What else stood out to you? Um. Well, I'm very pissed about Aswald. I was very upset that he was killed at the end. And this is like the first time I'm going to say this, but yes, I was shipping them from the very beginning. And I was very sad that he ended up, you know, sacrificing himself. And that was for, for the greater good. Um, you know, honestly, like as much as I enjoyed convinced it. They, I was convinced they were going to end up together. And <laughs> as much as I enjoyed this book, there was so much that just pissed me off. And it wasn't like how it was written or anything. It's just how these people are. Like, I really wanted to bitch slap okay. most of them. Um, like Treve. At least he was fully honest with who he was. I mean, to be fair. There to that. No, but I mean, like, um, when she's finally reunited with the first lieutenants... And they're all like, well, yeah, we could tell you where we were. It's like, oh, so we had a secret club because her first lieutenant was killed. Therefore, whoop, we just can't let you know where we are because we got the secret club. You don't know the handshake. We can't help you right now. Fucking bullshit. Like, there, I know that, you know, to be a man is to be one in untold billions. No. No, especially not if you're going to be like, oh, we're all Cadian. Fuck you. Cadians wouldn't do that. Now, getting on to the Cadians... These Cadians are the stereotypical Cadians that I've learned to hate in post-Cadia. We're better than all of you. You have no idea what we've been through, and we're better than all of you. Like, our discipline. We're not even going to try to be on your level or try to, like, compromise. Because you have to show us that you're worthy because we're Cadian. It's like... I was ready for her, like, to really bitch slap everybody. And then I wanted to throttle the captain who's when uh, he was like, yeah, we had our old first lieutenants we're all meeting over here. And if it wasn't for Oswald saying that he would come and, you know, fight with the stick, I guess we should come and rescue you. I'm like, thanks. Don't do us any favors. It's very much. So that kind of segs us way really nicely over into the first question here, which is life in the guard, right? Um, how is this book as a recruitment tool? I, I think you're right. I think it is. It's to be a man, to be a man or a woman, a person, um, is one to be one of untold billions, right? Like, they, we lost a tank and everybody on board. Oh, okay. At the same Again, time, though. It's a day that ends in Y. At the same time, though, when they all got back together, they're like, man, we lost a lot of people. It's like, well, maybe if you tried to, you know, save the other people that were still out and about, maybe you wouldn't have this problem. No, and that's kind of one of those things that the Imperium is oftentimes its own worst enemy, right? Where it's like, okay, because they do have this giant unfeeling machine that it's like, well, we lost a guy. Oh, well, just keep going, right? Like, if you would stop and go back and help these people, that's a whole other Lehman Rust tank you have at your disposal. That's a whole other group of guys. It's all this, like, all these resources and stuff. There's... On one hand, yes, there's all the sacrifice and all of that, but the Imperium's kind of wasteful for, like, everything, all of their resources, the tanks, the people. It's kind of wasteful, yo. I was like, I don't know if you remember this really bad show back on, I don't know, NBC or whatever, back when I was much younger. It was called Dinosaurs. They had, like, the puppet, the puppet dinosaurs. It was, like, an actual sitcom. Oh God, yes, not the mama. Yes, not the mama. Yes, that one. I do remember that. It had the one of the darkest sitcom endings ever. I didn't finish it, so I don't know exactly how it ended. But I know how the, the meteor comes to Earth. Well, I know how the dinosaurs ended. So you know, I mean, they were gonna die. That's how they ended the sitcom, though. Well, I mean, like that... the light, the lights suddenly go dark in their house, and you're like, "Wow, what the?" Well, so what I was going to say is, there's this one episode is actually not very good. Um, but it had something that always stuck with me. And it was the whole concept of more. And they kept saying, there's always going to be more because that's what more means. And that's all I keep thinking about with, with the Imperium. It's like, there's always going to be more. 
because that's what more means. Like, yeah, maybe we don't have enough people like like right now. Well, that's got to be somebody else's fault, right? Like we can, but there's always more people elsewhere. It's frustrating. Right. It is absolutely frustrating. It is. And, and there's a sort of fatalism embedded into that mentality too, right? Like, oh, well, we lost those hundred people. There's got to be more. And if there's not more, huh, that's just our lot in life, huh? I guess. Uh, and I, I know that this is so trite to say, like, I don't want to live in the Warhammer 40k universe. But I think this book was just a nice reminder that if anybody was ever like I want to live in the 40k universe I'd be like have you read Steel Tread because no you don't uh, I mean there's it's frustrating but that doesn't mean it was a bad book it just it was a just a, uh, a different glimpse onto things um, to really kind of show like what it's like being in the Imperial Guard like and we've read other Imperial Guard Astra Militarum books before but this one was the first one we really read to me that kind of really delved into like a core crew especially like with this with this with this tank crew and how all the these different crews how they all work together with infantry and and everything else and so it was a really is a fascinating look into it but it pissed me the hell off because the imperium just is so frustrating and everybody is so incredibly selfish I think that's why i couldn't get over is how selfish everybody they say it's for the good of the imperium bull fucking shit they're all out for themselves yeah they there can, is they can say there is they a are, little bit of that you're not entirely wrong I mean, so just look at that soul's own crew very much so but i wonder if it's like Especially with some of their crew, and we'll talk more about this later with the crew dynamic in general, but, like, I wonder if because it's one of those things that, like, you know when you get, like, when you first get, like, that thousand-piece puzzle or that 1,500-piece puzzle, what's the first thing that you do? You work on the border, right? Because it's easier to sort through all of those pieces and just grab those edge, straight edge pieces, right, than it is to just, like, start and go. Well, that explains why it takes me forever to do puzzles. Oh, anyways, but one of the things, like, I almost wonder if it's because everything is so big and so vast that, yeah, a lot of these people end up just coming in on themselves, right? Because it's like, it's so hard when they were talking about, like, the musters and the tanks and all of these people and just the sheer amount of humanity that's present in, the, present in this war front. It's like... It's just too much. Like, it's too much to comprehend. So your world, despite being ginormous and huge and part of this big thing, your world just shrinks down to the size of your tank and your people. And sometimes that gets to be too so too much. So then you just focus on you. And you actually get very myopic, despite being very, very much, again, part of this huge, big machine, really. Are you trying to say they're all just a cog in the machine? Yes. Hmm. That's not how I was wording it, but that's actually a much better way. Yes. Um, so let's talk, let's focus on Etzel. Let, let, let us also be very monofocused. Let's talk about Etzel herself. How did you like her as the commander? She was great. She was one of my favorite characters. I liked the hell out of her. Mostly, I think with this book, I think in the hands of a lesser author, it would have been very easy to make her quasi Mary Sue and like ha make her have all the answers and have the rousing speech that brings mm. them all together and, you know, bring, makes them all better people and never gets scared yeah, and that's, understands everything. That's actually one thing I was telling my husband about why I kind of enjoyed reading this book over the typical space marine stuff. It said, you know, I love my space marines and everything, but there's only so much like we know no fear that you can take it. You know, it's so easy for them to be like, you know, don't look at it. Okay, sir. And then they don't versus a human, you know, what goes through their minds. You know, I think that's part of the reason why even when we were reading um, Night Summit Crag, some of our favorite parts were with the, the regular people on the ship, how they were dealing with, you know, the 
renegade navigator who has <laughs> kind of went a little nuts and and you know so now it's these people and how they deal with you know heretics and sorcery with with the heretics uh so i would have been very disappointed if she would have been in mary sue and had all the answers and never got afraid and never you know because she even talked about she had a moment of stupor you know when she just suddenly had, she couldn't even think that was very well humanizing. i love it was so human and i loved the scene when the knight rears its head again and she freezes she mm -hmm. just freezes right and everybody's like we need orders we need orders and it forces vaslov to stand up right and be like do this do that it it inspires him a little bit to be like oh i need to get out of this funk that i've been in because this is ridiculous but then it also showed because remember she snaps out of it but she had that moment where mm -hmm. she's just paralyzed with fear because oh god i thought we killed it what are we gonna do like it was just very very human of her and she needs answers i like when she's talking to the tech priest because the tech priest warbles off to her and she goes in gothic slowly low gothic like, she was very low specific gothic. that's right low she was gothic. very specific low gothic slowly so it's not like he can just rattle off a bunch of stuff and she's like oh, of course i understand off off i'm off to do my thing now like she's terrified and she's scared and she doesn't know everything and i did actually really like so you know when you get something stuck between your teeth and you just can't get it out like no matter how much you try and tongue at it when we read Penitent last year, there is a scene in that book that is the thing that I cannot get out of my mind, no matter how much I try. It is the equivalent of, like, the piece of cat hair that you can't get out of your mouth. You. Yeah. I was thinking or dog spinach, hair. but, you know, whatever. Spinach works, too. Or, like, a poppy seed, and you get it, like, wedged in between your teeth. Um, but there was a scene... And it's when the per I can't remember if it was the I think it's the dude who's talking and he's like, well, of course, we all know that there were originally 20 Primarchs and every person in the room goes, well, yeah, that's common knowledge. No, it is not, friends. That mm. so <laughs> the fact that she doesn't even really believe that space Marines are real. Right. So it just shows like this. It shows this. I don't want to say ignorance because I mean, I mean not, not intentional ignorance, but yeah, she's just. She's just a very much... I just thought you were going to say... Never mind. What? I was going to say something bad about Penitent and the writer, but continue. Oh, no. And I don't I don't want to make it totally sound like I'm abnet bashing. But I think that's one thing that he's kind of forgotten. And so it was really nice to read this book and just see, like, normal people, normal peopling. Like, she's just rank and file guard. And she got... I also liked that... And this is going to sound so weird. But we've talked about this a lot, especially... Um, that one book mark of faith we talked about this a lot in that book where it's good that she doubts herself she has doubt but then she knows that she has to portray confidence at least she's not she's slashing not... her wrists over it yeah there's also another tendency with female characters to make them way too self-effacing right like oh i'm just not good at this and nobody likes me and no they don't trust me and they're just oh they'd be so much better with another commander like she gets a little bit of like i don't think i know what i'm doing and i don't think i was the right person for this but she just keeps soldiering on right like he didn't make her wallow too much in self-pity he actually managed to just find her like right on that straight and narrow of like again very human and I really liked that. Did you like her story overall? Yes. I really did. I really crushed when Aswald got killed. That was not cool. I, I'm sure I don't need to say that I was like rooting for them as a couple uh, from pretty much the get go. But I was devastated devastated when he died because i was like okay so then after all of this is over she's gonna go find him and like he'll be injured and they'll make some jokes and we'll get to ship them and write fan fiction for the rest of the year no 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 and he, i got gets killed i got really sad when she like went to her chest and was like what was he and she realized where the flask was that's exactly where he was tapping I'm like yeah i just gotta dig that dagger in a little deeper don't we just in case you weren't sad that he's dead. Boom. Mm. 
Yes, I also was like, oh, you bastard. <laughs> it was it was a really nice character moment for both of them. Mm -hmm. But also, and I did like that, the, again, that's part of the guard, right? Is that sometimes someone's got to go up there and make that decision. And I liked that it showed that he was ultimately a very good commander, too, because he's like, all right, I'm in charge. It's going to be me. Right. And he was having his own problems. He was like, I'm first lieutenant by default because <laughs> everybody else was killed. <laughs> exactly. I was like, well, exactly. Sometimes that's how it works. Ask Dante. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yes. And both of them kind of got just thrust into this role that they weren't ready for. And or rather that they didn't think they were ready for. Um, which again I think goes back to that whole that goes back to that whole like the the coldness of the Imperium. And I know that that happens in real life and whatever. But yeah, all these people that you just kind of get like, hey, guess what? You're in charge now. Grats. Oh. <laughs> Wasn't expecting that. Let's talk about the crew dynamic. What did you think of the crew in general? Were they good? Did you like the dynamic between them? There was only two crew members I liked, and that was Vero and Moritzen. Moritzen? Okay, so let's go by them one by one. So let's start with Moritzen. I, I liked Moritzen for a couple of reasons. One, she was just a good soldier. Like, we've got a new commander. Okay, cool. Right. Listen to her and follow her. I'm not going to cause any drama because I just want... I just want the machine to move smoothly. She knew her job. She did her job very well. I was appreciative every single time Andy Clark wrote the clang, clang, clang. You know, when she loaded, when she loaded the main weapon. I mean, she was exactly what you need out of a soldier. She was. And I will say, and I don't know if Andy Clark did this on purpose, but... um. One of my favorite character beats, just random character beats in a movie, is in Saving Private Ryan. I don't know if you remember, nobody knew what Tom Hanks' background was, mm -hmm. right? Like, they kept guessing and they kept guessing. And it's not until the very end when he's like, I was a school teacher. Like, he just reveals it's this very plain background, right? But it was this, like, mystery. Who is this guy? And they borrowed that from Moritzen. I like that. You don't really know who she is. You don't know her tragic backstory. She didn't need to be like, and here is why I'm the way I am. Right. She just was. Was. Yeah. I liked her very much. Vero. I also liked for the same reason. Because Vero, we get to know a lot more about Vero as a Cadian. Right? Well, yeah. Because, we, uh, you know, he's one of the three people we get his perspective. Perspective mm -hmm. on. So, yeah. I mean... But he was like the only Cadian who actually tried to have to be have respect for a new commander. Right. And I did like that he was sad No wait, about Moritzen Kadian. was Cadian. Wasn't she? Yes, she was. was. She, yes, she was Cadian. I had Nix to remember wasn't. that one. That's right. Um I liked that. But he was I so like, respectable, like from the very beginning. He was so respectable. When Nix is like, hey, I want to look through her bag. And he's like, absolutely not. So Commander, she's like, yeah, she hasn't earned my respect yet. Let me look through her bags. Like, bitch, like learn your place here. Vero knew his place. Moretzen knew Vero, his place. Moretzen, they both knew their place. Moretzen knew hers and Vero knew his. And I did like the way that I liked that she... Or that he, I like that Pharaoh, he, you know, he reminisced about Cadia and he was very sad to have lost Cadia. And like, he talks about losing, I'm assuming that was his partner, Marco, he loses because he mentions that, that he's gone. Like, he goes through the list of everything he's lost, but he's not, it, he has to live up to the Cadian standard, right? And he has to continue to fight in the Emperor's name because that's what Cadians do. But he's not like, oh, woe is I, my planet. Like, you know, we just got to keep going on. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like, yes, we lost Cadia. Yes, that's terrible. We got to keep going on and we cannot be this insular. Nobody else is cool enough to play with us. I really liked Barrow because he also was very human. He was tired. He pushed himself beyond his limits. I did like at the end when he's like, 
oh god, I should never have told him that I was fine. I'm I'm messing up all over the place because of my shoulder. Mm -hmm. It was just very, again, it was just very human. Right. Go to Vaslov. No. I really liked Vaslov at the end. I did not like him up until that moment I was talking about earlier where she's paralyzed with fear and he steps up. He just goes right in there and he's like, okay. Because that would could have been his moment to be like, okay, and thus we die. Not my circus, I, not my uh, monkeys. I don't care. I appreciated him in that moment, just like I appreciated mm -hmm. him when he held Treve back from stopping Pharaoh from, you know, doing the little blood blood magic on the tank. And he was like, you know, Commander told you to sit down. I, I respected that, but I couldn't take the snobbery. It just puts you in a Cadian uniform and you, th and you think that you're Cadians. Like, do you think you're so much better? I'm sorry. Her planet's not gone. Whose planet has gone around here? Um, yours. So I don't understand why you're so much, why you're acting like you guys are so much better than everybody else. You're all soldiers. And it just, even when she confronted him about it, I was like, this is the moment he's going to redeem himself. And instead he just doubled down. Like, you're just a crusty old bastard. I'm like, I'm done with you. I actually really liked his point of view. I don't agree with it, obviously, but I understood it when he was basically like, look, ours was the most important planet. We were the watchmen at the gate, but, right? And right. we described okay. it that way. Is that Etzel's fault? No. Is that anybody else's fault? No. That's where I have the problem. I understand he has all this guilt, but stop taking it out on people who are not Cadian because guess what? You're not more special than they are. Well, and if you remember, it was a twofold thing, right? Because he's like, A, we lost the planet. We didn't just lose a planet. We lost the planet. But then also he, he says, he's like, look, our last commander knew it. He said, this planet is a worthless mud ball and we're all going to die for it. Like, so unfortunately, he had been kind of poisoned and tainted by that, right? Because that was a good friend of his, Acadian, and a good who friend of his who had become an alcoholic and yeah. had lost, you know, wasn't really with it. You know, and I understand that you, you stay with those friends even when they're, when, when they're kind of losing it. But you also have to understand that they're not who they were. Accept that. And then don't put that burden on somebody else. Right. I, I agree. It's your I... shit to go through. It's not hers. True. But that was also his world view. I, I understand. I can understand why people wouldn't have liked it. I, I really sympathized after in that moment. I was like, oh, dude, you're absolutely right. Not her fault. This is not her problem. Also, shake it off and move on. You're not the only Katie. And I do like when she was like, do all Katians feel this way? And he goes, well, no, but a lot do. That's, that's some baggage. That's some baggage to be carrying around now. And it also sucks because, like, just some asshole showed up one day with all of his friends to destroy your planet. You know, some guy named Abaddon. Pfft. You might like, not have heard of him. Had a Blackstone Fortress. Something like that. Parry this. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, I guess that's one thing that they'll never understand either is that there is nothing they could have done to save the planet. Right. It, he definitely had hardcore survivor's guilt of we should have gone down with the ship basically I felt like that was I felt like that's kind of where he was at he's like if we lost this we should have gone down with it and I do I do feel bad for the Cadians because there will never be like two Cadians could get together and have a baby and that okay that'll be a Cadian but not like again going back to what we just they read won't have the violet eyes there's that but then also going back to the book that we just read, uh, The Wolf Time, when they were talking about Fenris, right? And they're like, okay, yes, you have the blood, but you don't have the experience. You have Cadian blood. You didn't grow up on Cadia, right? So you don't really understand. Wow, I just realized we just read, you know, two geographically snobby books in a row. We did, actually. Yeah, we're better than you because we grew up on this planet. Creve. Um, 
retrieve. Like I said, at least he was very open and honest, like who he is. He never had a front. He never. I mean, to what 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 can you say about him? He's, you know, not a lot. If there really. was, if this was, you know, Canterbury Tales, he would have been the. Um, oh my gosh. The last tale where the guy gave a sermon ruined the whole Canterbury. He would have had an entire was tale unto himself. It wasn't the pastor. It was like the parishioner. It was something like that. Um, Might be parishioner. But he, so when I went into this book, I was a little scared. I was kind of worried that they were going to go the kind of trite route where it's like, oh, now you're going to learn about each of these characters and you'll get to hear their backstories and why they are the way they are. And by the end, They'll all be different people and come together as best friends. And Treve softens a little bit at the end, right? Because of everything they've been through. When he's like, yeah, 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 deal me in. I got to know about it, right? Like, that was probably a soft moment. But he's still like, we don't really get to know anything about him. He's just a pious dickhead. Yeah. But if you recall, they're kind of like, eh, typical Brythonian. Right. Like, <laughs> this is just how their people are. Right? And... I actually really liked that. And you're very, I hated him as a character just because he was so aggressive or so abrasive and so gruff. I just, I was like, I don't like you. You're not a nice, not that he was badly written. I just didn't connect with him at all. But I did like that he was very much, this is who I am. And I He would have been one of those like people it. that gets on the public transit and is suddenly like, I need to talk to you all about your Lord and Savior. He's one of those guys. He is absolutely that guy. He is 100% that guy. Just wants to know if you've heard about that Jesus guy. I I like, I, I liked that honesty of him. There was no fronting. Like, you didn't discover that he was secretly judgmental. Oh, no, 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 no. no. He's, no. I mean, even the very beginning when he was gone and she's chastising him for being gone. And he was like, I was doing prayers. It's like, that's no excuse. Yeah. He's like, but I was doing prayers. Like, he doesn't see that anything he has done is wrong because he's, you know, doing the Lord's work, so to speak. Yeah. Exactly. Which is funny, but also like... <laughs> right. <laughs> All right, let's save the best for last. Or the most interesting for last. Nyx. Is she really that interesting? I actually liked the hell out of her. I, I hated her. Hated her. She reminded me and I know that she's a hive girl. I have a very, I don't know why, but for some reason, I always like the hivers. Like, it's one of the reasons I really like the Necromunda novels. I just really like those, the hive characters, those badass street characters. I did like that basically as soon as Etzel, like, pounds her in the face, all of a sudden she's like, yeah, okay, chief. It was like, she just had that, like, street mentality. Almost like a prison mentality of... I don't respect you. Oh, you just kicked my ass. I am yours for life now. I can't forgive what I can't forgive her. Like so I was I'm trying to kill her. That was absolutely unforgivable. Three days, three days. She's on job. She's like, ah, she's not worth it. Who are you to judge on that? As they kept pointing out, you're a gangbanger off the streets. You mm -hmm. are on the lower end of that totem pole in terms of rank. Who are you to decide who is worthy? It was like, um, and uh, darkness of darkness of the blood when uh, I think it was darkness of the blood yes yes when um, when Dante basically tells that guy you're going to be admiral and you're going to like it type thing and then uh, his second in command kills him because he's like you're not mm -hmm. worthy who are you to make that decision Dante just put him in charge now you get to go tell Dante what happened it's the same thing I mean and it put her in an awful position because she couldn't kill Nyx back because then the whole tank, then the whole cruise would turn against her because it's, you know, her word versus theirs. But yeah, but, you know, when she's doing her prayers for the weak and the unworthy and then she tries to kill her, like, she's like, you just try to run all the time. It's like, you don't know anything. And I can't stand people who make snap judgments like that to the point, like, you want to make a snap judgment so you don't like somebody. All right, fine. You don't get to go kill them over it because you think that they're unworthy. So who was going to lead your tank if she was killed? Vaslav? Good luck staying alive. She didn't even think that far ahead. 
And that is why she's at the bottom of the totem pole because she can't think that far ahead. She would have sucked at chess. It was amazing. She was, the reason why she's good at cards is because it was gambling. Well, there is that. I liked her because she did have that gang mentality. But she had also served on a tank with a literal drunk. A drunk who Vaslov admits, by his own admission, right, had basically said, this isn't worth our time. We're dying over nothing. Um, and Vaslov himself, so both of her command structures were very weak people. And then you get a person who her first order is to run away. Right? Like, And that's one of the things about the Imperium that I often struggle with, too. Because, like, what's his face? Uh... Caiaphas Kane often deals with that, right? Where he like saves his skin and he's like, oh my God, what a heretical coward I am. And you're like, no, you lived to fight another day, my dude. Like, same thing with her. See, now that's right? something I did appreciate about Vaslov. When, cause she's, she's like, when Etzel confronts him and she's like, you think that I'm, I just run away from everything. And he's like, no, I understand duty. That's not what it is at all. But Nyx can't see past that true but that's kind of her character i did and i and it, have literal no use for it i mean i was like <laughs> i hated her her turnaround in the end is like no i mean i understand like i understand why etzel didn't turn her over to the commissar i really do because it would have caused like more problems in the end but i don't know i might have shot her later i mean that's <laughs> Now, you don't do that. And to me, that makes her untrustworthy the rest of the time. I don't care. She says she calls her chief like, oh, she's never done that before. No, she turned her gun on her commander on the third day. That's, you can't mm -hmm. trust someone after that. I would never trust her. So I didn't like, well, I, I get, couldn't stand her. I get the impression that Etzel doesn't fully trust her still. I mean, she thought about it with the commissar, right? When Vera yeah. was like, are you going to turn her into the commissar? And she was like, I should. Like, you could, like, she had to do some mental arithmetic there of, okay, <laughs> I'll be down a gunner. We could probably find another gunner. That's okay. Like, she had to do some calculations mm -hmm. there. Do I have to keep this person alive? And she opted to. But she also, I mean, she also made right, like, she did it in a way that made it sound like this was her only trend, her only shot. All right? Like, any, any other BS from her and she's gone. Well, she pretty much told her that, you know, if you raise yeah. a hand or barrel of your gun to me ever again, you won't even get to hear me mention a firing squad, you know. Right. So, like, I don't mind characters with a little flavor and a little color. I can't stand traitors. <laughs> so, speaking of traitors, the villain is interesting in this book. Basically, Baragor has no screen time. Did that work for you? And did it make sense? It did work for me. It worked. It made com complete sense, especially since considering these are just one unit of this massive campaign going on. And honestly, I think it might, I think it made a better story. Um, you know, the fact that it was almost kind of a, a monster movie in a way with the heretic knight hunting them and, uh, and then I'm trying to deal with trying to get away from it once again. It was like, you know, a little bit like how, you know, Jurassic Park was cool, you know, because you didn't really see the dinosaurs. You just heard them. So it, to me, that that worked very, very well. I think I've been disappointed if we did actually see him. I have to agree with you on that. I think that's I think that's another reason that this was such a day in the life of a guardsman book for me and why I liked it so much was that the average guardsman is going to bleed and lose literal limbs and friends and they're i mean it is a crappy life and you never even get to see what you're fighting for or against right right like you're yeah. just fighting for the imperium and you're just fighting against those who are against the imperium well, think like about those who got you know shot when they first walked up there i mean they really got to see nothing yeah exactly so like you go all this way, you go through all of this heartache and this trouble and this nightmare, and you don't even get to see the guy. And I think because we read so many Space Marine novels, again, like, in a Space Marine book, there would have been a confrontation. There would have been a discussion. Yeah. And actually, as soon as they started describing the noise Marines, my first thought is I was like, how the hell does a guard unit deal with noise Marines? There's just no way. And yeah. sure enough, there really was no way. They had to find a way around them. And those that went up against the noise marines got killed. 
Mm-hmm. And like, I did also like that we know what they are, but they didn't. They're just like, dude, they've got like these weird noise emitter things. Like, they didn't label them like, oh, it's the Emperor's Children. That's the Third Legion, Fulgrim's Legion. Yeah, they worship Slanash. Like, I still feel as though... Well, because again, most people only know of nine Primarchs. Exactly. There's only nine and sons I, and nine devils. Exactly. And you don't know the devil's names other than Horus? So... Horus was the, the big bad devil. He was the big bad one. Uh, I... Like, was Lucifer himself. Everybody else was like, you know, like Beelzebub the lesser and demons. Mephistopheles <laughs> and yeah. So, it's one of those things where it's like I really, I thought that really worked. The knight, I think I've said before, one of my favorite video games of all time was Resident Evil Nemesis because back in the 90s when you first played it Nemesis was this horrific lurking presence that you could not fight straight up. You could injure him a little bit, but you couldn't kill him. And you would hear him chasing you throughout the city. And then all of a sudden he would just burst through the wall and you'd be like, oh, good. <laughs> I have nothing but a combat knife. Um, that's why back in the days when you had to just use the combat knife because you needed the magnum and the shotgun for when Nemesis showed up. Um, but... The night, like, I loved that so much. The night, like, hit that soft spot for me where I was like, oh, a lurking terror. And it was horrific. The way they described it. I did love when Etzel finally was like, I don't think anything's piloting that. Yeah, sweetheart, it's a demon engine. Yeah. <laughs> there was somebody piloting it, but he is now one with the machine. Exactly. Exactly. He is now a... He has now ascended to something different. It was like when they were talking about all the spine backs that they saw that had melded to their equipment. Yeah. Ooh. I appreciate that Andy Clark remembered the difference between player knowledge, not character knowledge. Because, again, like, these are just guardsmen. They don't, they don't, like, I don't even know what Baragor would have said. Probably wouldn't have even deigned to talk to her. Well, No. Right, so had she come up with it, it would have rung false. And the weird thing is, like, when they mentioned heretic Astartes, only the Cadians understood what that meant because they saw them. Right, because remember, she was like, what? What? Like, no, 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 there's not even, there's not even real Astartes. How could there be heretic Astartes? Like, yeah, you're right. Like, the Cadians are like, oh, geez. Not these guys again. Because, you know, they're near the eye. They've seen some stuff. To be fair, but I actually thought I mean, it worked really Lorgar, well. Lorgarsh probably should have put the planet out of its misery way back then. <laughs> when he told right. it, when just he, it off. When he told it from orbit, told his uh, adopted dad, "You know what? You're crazy. I'm just gonna blow this place up and then move on." But then we wouldn't have had the whole heresy, so it would have been very, very boring. Um, having said that, I. Okay, and this is one of those things where I was like, ah! So, the characters, I understood. Okay, I understand why she doesn't know what's going on. And on one hand, it made for a very effective book. Because, yeah, she just fought, and guess what? War's not even over on this planet. Just because he's dead doesn't mean he doesn't have assholes around still running around. Gotta go fight them! It's gonna be a little easier, but we still gotta deal with them, right? Like, it's just, alright, we did that, and now it's on to the next fight. just heretics right here, like... Right. That's a whole and I think, planet, not a continent. Right. And that is one thing that it gets very, and I know I've said this before, but in Warhammer 40k, it does get very hard. It does get very easy to forget that a planet is like big. If well, something happens sometimes, here in Denver, London's totally different. <laughs> well, and sometimes I feel like even the authors lose track of that yeah. as, as well with stuff. There's just one city and one place, like one little, like small. It's not even a city generally. It feels like there's like a, like a county, on a whole planet, with some of these, right? So I did right. like that. They're like, well, we killed them. On to the next fight. But like, me personally, I was like, but like, why were they there? What was their goal? I need to know their motivation. Well, to quote Vaslav, heretics. Yeah, heretics gonna heretic yo. He's not wrong. So, the whole... You could argue that one of the characters in this book 
is kind of Cadia itself. What did you think of Vaslov's and Etzel's musings on Cadia in general? Like, as a place, as a symbol, as a phrase, does Cadia stand? Your husband says it does. Often? Okay, at the end when she was like, Cadia stands. He was like, that's damn right it does! Oh god, every time I said Cadia stands in this friggin' book since I read aloud to him, he was like, yes it does! I think I like it though as a symbol and as like a call of defiance. Well, you know, I also kind of think of it as you know, Thor Ragnarok. Cadia's not a place, it's a people. She thought more of like, okay, so I'm about to reference an ancient movie. In Casablanca, there's that scene in the bar where the Germans are all singing the German national anthem and uh, Laszlo gets up and he starts singing the French national anthem and all of a sudden everybody's crying, screaming, vive la France. They're in Morocco. It's the middle of the war and it's more of like this defiant, like, yes, like, vive la France, like, taking back this, screw you, we still are here and we are still fighting. I really liked that. I so I liked the idea. I liked the idea of Cadia stands as like, as you kind of, but also like, as you said, like it is a people and we stand for it. Etzel's not even Cadia. She's not even Cadian, but Cadia stands. It is just a defiance for what was lost. And it hit me in the feels. So that'd be great if those people, if her crew had remembered that sooner. The real treasure was the friends they made along the way, Carrie. Sure, sure. Friends that you really can't trust after that, but you know, whatever. It's all good. I say as I'm. Oh my gosh! As I'm with my Alpha Legion mug. I was gonna say, like, oh my god, Alpha again, over there. Again, at least uh, they're very upfront with who they are. Mm-hmm. They oh, are. they forgot what side they're on. I mean, they're very upfront with like, mm, you don't know what we're doing. Oh my god. Um, I'll have to tell you a funny story later about a conversation we had around the Horus Heresy. Um, I really liked it, though, and I liked this idea that they kind of come to, like, look, Cadia's more a symbol. It's a symbol, it's a people, it's a way of life. Uh, it's this just defiant statement that I really, I liked, and I found it, like, I want more of this crew and more of this story. One question I did forget to ask. How did you feel about them all making it out in the end? Which I know is a weird thing to say. I don't know how he could have done it any different. I mean, I, I, I really don't. Uh, I was expecting her to have not made it and maybe mm. that would have been good in a way. It's really funny because he has problems killing off people that need to go and then he kills off the wrong people. Yeah, I actually thought the same thing. <laughs> I was like, because at first I was like, oh, dude, Etzel died. Like, that's hardcore. And it also would have, like, I loved um, Rogue One, Star Wars Rogue One. Yeah. I loved that loved movie. It. Because, spoiler alert, everybody dies in the end. Like, nobody gets out, right? They it was so funny, though. Like, this so, like, within about, I don't know, when they, I think when they first get Jen and they're bringing her out, and Turner Sean is like, they're all going to die. He's like, you don't know that? I was like, yeah, I do. He goes, how do you know? I was like, because they weren't in the other movies. <laughs> they're all going Somebody to Somebody never read the expanded universe. <laughs> Everybody. Like, they easily could have been like, oh, they were off doing these other things and this thing and that thing and this Not thing. Not the way like, this was going. I knew that they were all going to die. Which I loved it. I thought I would have been actually very disappointed, very disappointed if they did get off and survived and then they had their own little extended universe series going on because I can't stand that shit. Okay, there is that. Um, I don't know. Like at first, I have really mixed feelings on it. I'm really glad Etzel survived because I like her and I like this crew. And I think this was a really good setup novel for something else to come next. But on the other hand, I was also kind of like, I think she kind of should have died. I mean, 
mean, she loses her leg and her eyeball. Yeah. And the tech marine helped her out with that. Or the tech, not the tech marine, the tech priest helped mm-hmm. her out with that, which is kind of cool, right? But I was also kind of like, oh, you killed Aswald. At least, at least let her go, too. <laughs> you bastards! Exactly when she said that she was going to meet him up in the bar. I got met. I got Mass Effect chills. Oh, uh, yes. I was like, um, um, Garrus and Shepard will be there, too. Well, because there is no Shepard without Vicarian. Exactly. Exactly. So I, I forgot about that. But I did very much like that. It was just... Overall, though, I thought it was just a really nice guard story. Like, hey, look, <laughs> life is short yeah. and terrifying in the guard. It really juxtaposes a lot of what else we read, typically. Yeah. I mean, it, it was it was nice. It, it was. Although, um, our next book is more guard? Yeah, but these are rich guard. That's true. This is like the Volpo and Blue Bloods. If you ever read the Gaunt's Ghost series, the Vol. God, that's a nice looking special edition. Um, if you is. ever read the Gaunt's Ghost series, the Volpo and Blue Bloods are kind of like. Even the bookmark if- is blue. Oh, God, I hate you right now. They're kind of like if James Spader from Pretty in Pink. What was this character's name? Oh, Steph, Steph McKee. Yeah. Steph. If Steph McKee, an entire regiment of Steph McKee. Which is awesome. But also, like, I'm actually really excited because they only ever showed up, like, twice in the Gaunt's Ghost series. And it was always just to be a foil to the scrappy ghosts, right? So, and they were always kind of, like, nose in the air, ready to go to the country club after this, darling. I mean, look at They them. don't reload their own guns. They have Charles to reload their it's guns. Like, look at them. They, they're handsome and beautiful. I mean, com- they are handsome and beautiful. Compare them like, to like the gritty people on Steel Tread, <laughs> who have seen some shit. Yeah. So Nyx up in here it looks like she hasn't showered in a few days. This girl, maybe she's born with it. Maybe it's Maybelline. Yeah. She gets it because she's worth it. She's one. Of, she's I one of those women who actually puts on makeup before a marathon. I will say, it's all foily on the back, even though this isn't the special edition. Um, oh, yeah, I'm excited so to read mine. it. When was the last time we read a Nick Kine book? Was it actually Knights of McCrag? It was Knights of McCrag, yeah. Holy shnikes, that's been a while. So, I'm excited. Um, it is going to be more guard. But Richie Rich guard, these people don't have to worry about reloading. Like, oh no, conserve ammunition! No, no. Daddy bought us more. <laughs> Daddy Volpone. I am really interested just, in how this works. I am actually going to be very interested with in it. Because, again, they were always kind of that foil regiment within the Gaunt's Ghost. They were a good, strong fighting regiment. But they always were just to be shown, like, as, like, look, we're just better than you. So I'm really Man, excited to see what Nick Himes going to do. Is third snobby? <laughs> huh? Is this going to be our third snobby people book in a row? <laughs> probably because then after this well people can probably guess what we're gonna read after this although i don't know really if anybody else people. i don't know if anybody else looked at the warhammer preview apparently this saturday everything releases literally everything i mean for the death pre-order? core of krieg yeah the death core of krieg book comes out which we'll eventually read the triumph of saint catherine which we'll eventually read and there's one other one that i was like oh we're gonna eventually read that one too uh, and I was like, oh, no. And then there's like a White Scars omnibus. And fortunately, I already have the Saints omnibus. Um, there was something else, too, that I was like, oh, my wallet just started crying. Is that what that noise is? It was. Because the, I, I'm hearing that, too, from my wallet downstairs. Makes sense, though. If you smell the spell, like if you smell plastic burning, totally normal. The card just seppuku'd. <laughs> Is that a verb? I think it's committed seppuku. I verbed the noun. And I'm okay with it. So it's not a nominalization. Is this not a verbalization? No verbalization, I guess. Mm. A verbation. We're going to go with verbation. Verbation? Okay. Verbation. 
Anyways. Let's go. Let's go. Shall, Shall we? Please, we? Carrie? Yes. I think we will. So you've listened to the Warhammer 40k book club episode regarding Steel Tread by Andy Clark. Be sure to join us next time for Volpone Glory by Nick Kime. We are an unofficial book club and not affiliated with the Black Library or any of its affiliates. You can find both the vidcast and podcast on our website, wh40kbookclub.com. If you like this episode, please like, subscribe, give a review, and all those things to the vidcast on YouTube or the podcast on anywhere you get podcasts. Our site also has articles about our adventures in reading other Warhammer 40k books and short stories outside of the book club books. So please stay a while and read from a crag. I'm still all furious. It's you some Martian red. She's turned against the chartreuse people. You heard it. I would also like to point out that my dead space marker looks phenomenal. Phenomenal on top of my my uh, Adeptus Mechanicus collection. I mean, it fits. Oh, it's totally canon within the I mean, Warhammer 40k universe. Fight I mean, me. they both got tentacles, so it makes sense. Tentacles? It's, it's a long story. It looks like tentacles from here. And the Mechanicus also have tentacles. So again, makes sense to me. Anyway. <laughs> Good night, everybody. Tentacles. Good night. <laughs>